Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Your Honors, my name is Andy Taggart, along with my law partner, Cherie Wade. I have the privilege of representing Gold Coast Commodities, Inc., the plaintiff and appellant in this matter. Gold Coast is a small family-owned business based just about a mile outside downtown Brandon, Mississippi, and doing business in that location since 1983. What you have before you, Your Honors, is a dispute over the question of the duty to defend arising out of an environmental policy of coverage. The question being whether, in fact, the district court properly analyzed the question of the difference between the duty to defend on the one hand and the duty to indemnify on the other. This court and the Mississippi Supreme Court have been very clear in presenting the proposition that those are, in fact, two different duties and the analysis about how to get to the end of each is different. Simply stated, on the duty to defend, the question is, is there any potential for liability under the policy? Is there any arguable basis for the duty to defend to be triggered? Are there any ambiguities because if they are either in the underlying complaint or in the policy, they must be construed in favor of finding the duty to defend? And if the question is ultimately whether the duty to indemnify would also be triggered, that is a question to be resolved later, sometimes even as late as after a jury has returned a verdict. But in this case, Your Honors, rather than following the state's eight corners rule, which stands for the proposition that when considering a duty to defend, the role of the trial court is to determine from the eight corners before it, the four corners of the complaint and the four corners of the policy, whether there is a basis for the duty to defend to be triggered. But the district court here, Your Honors, instead, after three years after briefing had been submitted, arrived at what can be called from its own language an overarching theme rule and concluded that there was an overarching theme of intentional action here on the part of Gold Coast and consequently there was no coverage under the policy and since there was no coverage, there's no duty to defend. But Your Honors, because of federal rule of civil procedure 10C, what Crum and Forster apparently failed to do and what I regret to say that the district court also might not have done is to consider the exhibits to the state court complaint because every one of them was a part of the complaint for all purposes under Rule 10C. Well, if they were a part of the complaint for all purposes, then they were a part of the complaint for consideration of the eight corners rule, which means that in determining whether the duty to defend was triggered, the district court should have considered the face of the allegations of the complaint itself along with the contents of its exhibits in addition to the policy. And when read together, Your Honors, the only conclusion that can be drawn is that in fact the duty to defend was properly triggered and Crum and Forster should have come in and taken the defense of the state court action rather than requiring its insured to fund its own defense all the way up to and through settlement on the second day of trial. Your Honors, Judge Wilson correctly in a dissent in a case called Sturkin versus the Mississippi Board of Mississippi Association of Supervisors cited the rule on how to consider when the duty to defend is to be triggered or not. It is, is there any basis for potential liability under the policy? That is to say, potential liability to the insured. Well, the simple fact of the matter is, Your Honors, that even though the city of Brandon in broad and sweeping and in many cases baseless allegations charged Gold Coast with intentionally discharging into the Brandon sewer system, the simple fact of the matter is the jury could have concluded that Gold Coast accidentally discharged into the sewer system. But counsel, that's not what the complaint says. The complaint alleges intentional actions. Indeed it does, Your Honor. What's in the exhibits that changes that? Thank you, Your Honor. Beginning, first of all, at page 136 of the, uh, of the record is the Laura James memo from 2016. Laura James was an investigator or analyst from MDEQ, the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. In three different locations, there are contents in that memo that clearly indicate that 
if in fact there was a discharge from Gold Coast on October 6th of 2016, that it must have been accidental. I direct the court's attention to uh, page 138 of the record, which is the second or third page of that memo. Ms. James herself asked, could there have been an accident that caused this? What might have led to the discharge of last week? She's interviewing them on October 10th about the October 6th discharge. And Mr. John Welch responded, well, we did have a pipe break, but we think that we caught it all in the sump and that it did not get out of here. I don't know anything about a discharge into the sewer. So, Your Honor, to answer your, the, your question in one way, Mr. Welch just could have been an error. That accident could indeed have led to the discharge of October 6th, and because it is in Ms. James's memo, which is Exhibit A to the complaint, it is a part of the eight corners rule that should have been considered. Second part of that memo, Your Honor, that would lead to the same conclusion is, a few pages later at page 142 of the, of the record, still in Ms. James's memo, Mr. Tom Douglas is uh, uh, reported by Ms. James as having said that the only thing we send into the sewer is sanitary, of course, what comes out of our bathrooms, and wash down water from the cement. So again, if a jury concluded that what Mr. Douglas said was in fact true, then it could also have concluded that nonetheless this discharge did come from Gold Coast, but since Gold Coast is not putting water down the sewer, it must have been an accidental discharge. And so, Your Honor, to answer your question specifically, my, my response is that reading the complaint with its exhibits, notwithstanding the city of Brandon's brash assertions about intentional action, could in fact have led a jury to conclude that there was an accidental discharge and that was included in the eight corners that were con should have been considered by the trial court. The other thing that I would say, Your Honor, on that point is uh, the complaint makes uh, to do in footnote two with a quote, a quote in quotation marks that purports to be from Mr. Tom Douglas saying, oh, we've been dumping down the, the sewer in Brandon for years. Well, Your Honor, that was not a, a quote that should have been inserted because it was not in quotation marks in its original source. The original source, if I'm doing that, I don't, I don't mean to, Your Honor. The, one, two, check one, two. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> in Exhibit C, Your Honor, which is the 2017 Tony Cox memo, at the second page, which I think is page 203 of the record, Mr. Cox relates on October 27th what he recalls about his conversation October 24th about what Mr. Andrew Walker told him about what Mr. Tom Douglas supposedly told him. Mr. Cox does not put that conversation with Mr. Walker in quotes, and he does not say that he is quoting Mr. Walker. He's simply reporting his best recollection of what Mr. Walker told him about what Mr. Douglas supposedly told him. Well, Mr. Walker has since pled guilty to a felony for discharging improperly into the Jackson sewer system. And so I say, Your Honor, that to rely upon the conclusion placed in quotes in footnote two of the city's uh, complaint as a basis for asserting that, well, the city was only uh, asserting a claim for intentional action is to grant to the, the complaint credence that it does not deserve because internally it would be then inconsistent. And at, at a minimum, Your Honor, that's an internal ambiguity from the complaint which must be construed in favor of finding a duty to defend. None of this is just academic conversation, Your Honors, because the district court found incorrectly, for example, that the city was claiming that uh, Gold Coast was illegally discharging on, on October uh, 6th of, of 2016. That is not in the complaint, and that is not in Exhibit A. It simply says water was being discharged on that day. There are three conditions, Your Honor, on the occurrence coverage. There's an occurrence uh, coverage part and a claims made coverage part. The occurrence coverage part is the one that I asked the court to direct its attention to because that most clearly provides for the duty to defend here. And there are a number of conditions, but three of concern to the court that must be satisfied 
in order for the occurrence provision, which begins at page 60 of the record, to be triggered. And I'll take them in reverse order because the first, first, fifth, and sixth, the sixth one is troubling. The sixth condition, which is at page 61 of the record, says that in order for this coverage to apply, any physical injury or property damage or pollution condition leading to or resulting in cleanup costs must first have occurred during the policy period. Well, that's troubling, Your Honors, because at page 34 of its brief, Crum and Forster misquotes that condition. And I only came upon this in my, in my very final preparations. We didn't even realize it when we submitted our rebuttal brief. But at page 34 of Crum and Forster's brief, it misquotes condition six in a way that literally reverses its meaning. Because condition six is limited only to questions about cleanup costs. And this is not a case about cleanup costs. This is a case about damages. And both damages and cleanup costs are covered under the, the uh, occurrence uh, coverage part. But in their brief, Crum and Forster leaves out the qualification that condition six deals with cleanup costs and not with damages. And if you read it that way, Your Honor, which would be opposite the way that the policy is written, you do come to the conclusion that anything that happened outside of the policy period somehow negates coverage within the policy period, even under the occurrence coverage part. And that is not what the policy says. So that's condition six. Condition five says that there must be an occurrence involving your work in order for this coverage part to, to uh, apply. Well, the work question, even though it's raised, uh, there's much ado made about it in Crum and Forster's uh, brief, really should not give the court much pause. The only question is, did this arise out of Gold Coast's collection or transport of restaurant grease and oils, which is their basic raw uh, stock for making animal feed stocks, liquid animal feed stocks is their end product. That's what they do. They collect and transport this stuff. So they're doing their work. Was there an occurrence? It goes back to your honor's question, Judge Wilson. Was there an accident, including a continuing exposure? And the simple fact of the matter is, your honor, if we read the raw allegations of the complaint, it does include claims not just of intentional action, but also of negligence and recklessness. Now, punitive damages would be, would be excluded, but there's nothing in the language of the policy that says that negligent or reckless action is excluded only that punitive damages would be. So again, the jury could conclude that Gold Coast acted in a way that was short of the recklessness necessary for punitive damages to be awarded and still award uh, compensatory damages. That's why the city of, Br I'm sorry, Your Honor. If there was a, an intentional dumping, I presume, Your Honor, it would just have to be let into the manhole. Uh, uh, the, 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 the city alleged that Gold Coast was shipping it to the city of Jackson to be dumped, but that, the vendor was doing that. It, in trucks, in tanker trucks. No, ma'am, big tanker trucks. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but, but, Your Honor, you, you hit upon a very important point because there's nothing in the complaint except for the fact after the October discharge that talks about shipping to the city of Jackson that provides the court any basis whatever to conclude how it is that Gold Coast was doing this. The allegation is for an unknown number of years leading up to 2014. Well, that's, that's virtually meaningless. I do want to get to condition one very quickly, Your Honors. That is that the condition requiring that no one at Gold Coast have known about a prior occurrence that would reasonably give rise to a claim under this policy. Well, of course, by virtue of Crum and Forster's reading of the policy, nothing that happened would give reasonable basis to a claim, but there's certainly nothing reasonable about concluding that an allegation from sometime before 2014 could reasonably lead to a claim under an occurrence coverage in a policy that had a policy period from August of 2016 
to August of 2017. So, Your Honor, conditions 1, 5, and 6 are all, in fact, satisfied, and the duty to defend does, in fact, attach. Thank you, Counsel. You've saved time for rebuttal. Mr. Risley. Did I say your surname correctly? Pardon? Did I say your surname correctly? You did it exactly. Okay. Welcome to the court. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Common Forster Special Insurance Company, and before I address the merits, I want to talk about one issue that was raised by Gold Coast reply brief and the argument today. In the reply brief, Gold Coast says the only issue before the court is the duty to indemnify and the du I'm duty to defend, and the duty to indemnify is not before the court. The problem with that is the district court ruled on the duty to indemnify. On uh, page 511 to 12 of the record, I think it's also pages 38 or 39 of Gold Coast record excerpts, the district court said for the same reasons under Mississippi law, if there's no duty to defend, there's no duty to indemnify. So that ruling has been made He's conceded today it's not been challenged, so that any ruling on the duty to indemnify has to be infirmed because it was not challenged in this appeal. Now, as to the merits, there are several grounds upon which the motion to dismiss was granted. Uh, the main one, and the easiest one to affirm, I think, is the allegations uh, are insufficient to show an accident and therefore to show an occurrence under either the third party pollution part or the contractor's coverage part. Uh, next, for the third party pollution part, all of the allegations come within the intentional acts exclusion. Uh, Complement of that on the contractor's uh, pollution liability part is uh, any pollution condition which started before and continued into the policy period is deemed to have all occurred before the policy period. Can we start with your, your first one? Do, do you agree with your friend on the other side that reckless conduct that's alleged in the underlying litigation would be, I shouldn't say covered, trigger the duty to defend? No. So where's the exclusion for, I've seen the one for intentional, but where's the one for, for reckless conduct? Well, it's first? not an exclusion. It's in the definition of occurrence. Sure. Help me walk It's an walk accident, through. meaning something you didn't intend to happen. Reckless means you didn't care if it happened or not. That's why it's a different level of, of mental awareness than negligence. So I'm, I'm looking at the, and help me, because I realize that these, in these insurance cases, there's lots of documents, but I'm looking at page 54 of the record, paragraph 26, occurrence means an accident, including continuous or repeated exposure to substantially the same general harmful conditions. Is that the definition you mean? Yes. So I can understand why that would exclude intentional conduct, because if you intended it, it wasn't an accident, but people get into reckless accidents all the time. So I'm not sure I understand how we read reckless into that. I mean, people act recklessly and cause accidents. That's the, the roadways, unfortunately, are full of them. Well, I do think that reckless shows you intended to commit the act. You didn't care what the consequences were. So the decision to pollute, even though it may have been done recklessly, was not an accident. They intended to open up the valve and let the stuff pour out to hide it from the city. And that's, you've got to read you got to read the entire complaint in its entirety and not pick out one or two words. Well, what do you do with counsel opposite's assertion that the exhibits to the complaint suggest accidental conduct? Under the Mississippi version of the eight corners rule, you cannot consider those. They're attached to the complaint. Well, that's part a, of the complaint. That's a 12B6 issue. It's not an eight corners issue. The eight corners are, the eight corners are limited to the document in the complaint and the policy terms. Otherwise, all I have to do is attach to, uh, to my petition an affidavit, and I've created coverage that didn't otherwise exist. Mississippi, some, some states are more liberal. You can look at any document that's attached to decide whether there's a duty to defend or not. Mississippi has never recognized that. It is a strict eight corner state, and the strict eight corners here are that Gold Coast has been in business since 1983. They're highly knowledgeable. It was... Uh, from Gold Coast perspective, it was particularly foreseeable discharging the corrosive water would cause the exact injuries described herein. I, I'm a little, I'm a little surprised to hear you walk, run away from the exhibits because at least the third one or second one, the, the one that has the, we've been doing it for years, quotation obviously helps you a lot, but if we're going to live with just the four corners of the complaint, and I'll take your, your word for it for the moment on what Mississippi law requires, I don't understand, count one is negligence. 
Count two is, I'm in the underlying litigation, is gross negligence. And the one that is really odd to me is count three negligence per se, right? Because that one doesn't require any, as, as I read the way the allegation is, doesn't require any mens rea at all. It's just here are the one, two, three provisions of the city ordinance is violated and that was negligence per se. So why wouldn't those trigger the duty to defend? Because it's saying the conduct was negligent per se. In count three, there are no factual allegations. It incorporates the earlier allegations, which are the consistently and surreptitiously discharged corrosive material for an unknown number of years. It's just, obviously, the, the, the part of the eight corners rule that Gulf Coast wants to ignore is you don't look at labels or legal theories. You look at the facts. And the facts that are pled, every specific fact is of intentional conduct. Those are the only allegations contained anywhere in there. Can I ask you a question about the timing? Because I, I realize sure. I didn't mean to cut you off earlier, but you were making two points. One is about mens rea, and the other is about the sort of this has been going on for years, long before the policy period, and there's a lot in the briefs about that. I, so let's just assume for the sake of discussion that the, the conduct happened in 2014, or started in 2014, and there was dumping, dumping, dumping. As I understand the city's complaint, they wouldn't need to prove that it started in 2014 or it started in 2016 or that it started in June of 2016, they could, pr they could prove, as a matter of fact, that there was one, I take aside intentional, there was one discharge on, say, October 6th, 2016, in the policy period, and they could recover at least on the first three claims, the first three counts of the underlying complaint, right? They, don't, they, they, they absolutely alleged other stuff, but they don't need to prove any of those things. They just need to prove one discharge on October 6th, 2016, and they can recover for all of these complaint, these counts, right? No, I, I disagree. Oh, how, how? That gets us outside of the timing issue, but if it was an intentional discharge in October of 2016, it's still not covered. Sorry, and I'm sorry, and I meant to bracket, uh, maybe I didn't say it out loud, I was thinking it. Let's bracket the mens rea for a second and just talk about your, your, your point about the, the timing. I, I take the point that the city has alleged it's been going on for years, but they don't need to prove that, right? They just need to prove a discharge. They don't need to prove it, but they alleged it. And you cannot ignore those allegations in determining the duty to defend under the Eight Corners Rule. And the thing that's so odd to me is that, and I, we obviously have more, I do anyway, more experience with Texas insurance cases than Mississippi ones, but in the Texas ones, we see, we see these with some regularity. If plaintiffs allege all sorts of things, and they often allege in the alternative, right? They'll say it either happened on Monday or it happened on Tuesday. It couldn't have happened on both, right? It happened on Monday or Tuesday. And so they're going to prove one or the other. So you don't take both as true, right? You don't have to take all of it as true that when you're doing the duty to defend. You just say, well, if it, the duty to defend attaches to the Monday, then duty to defend. If the duty to defend attaches to Tuesday, then duty to defend. And here, the way I understand it is, yes, absolutely, you've got a really good argument on if this, you know, 2014, 15, 16, I get it. But they don't have to prove any of that. And, and your counsel on the other side, your friend on the other side says, look, if any conceivable way that the plaintiff could recover in the underlying litigation, then you may not have to indemnify them, but you, you got to defend them. I think that's what right. But you're talking about what they can prove if they prove it. See, that's not a duty to defend question. It's not what they can prove. It's not what the defendant can prove. It's what the plaintiff alleged. Yeah, and, what, and, and, so, and that's what I'm so confused about is that the plaintiff, the plaintiff's allegations, they just have to plead. They, they plead 10 things, right? And if one of them triggers the duty to defend, then you have to defend all, right? Great. So if they allege that there was a discharge in October of 2016, as long as it wasn't intentional, you got to defend it, right? If it's intentional and they've alleged intentional, it's not, well, there's no duty to defend it. And, and I'm sorry to belabor it. I'm just trying to isolate the two arguments. I, yeah. I'm trying to bracket the intentional for a second because we talked about that already. I well, just want to talk about the time. Well, let, let me address it this way. The court, in explaining its opinion why, Anything that occurred before August 25th, 2016 wouldn't be covered. And why anything after August 25th, 2017 wouldn't be covered. So let's bracket on that one year. Just because a discharge happened in that year does not mean it's covered under the policy. It doesn't create a duty to defend. If they had alleged that, for example, one day the hose that was emptying the truck had burst, it spilled on the ground, there's an accident. If they had alleged that uh, the connection, the valve, leaked. There's an accident. There's no allegations like that. And certainly they could have alleged in the alternative, 
But if you look at it, as the district court pointed out, if you look at the section headed negligence, everything in there is intentional. So you throw away the label, all you're left with is intentional acts. What's your authority that collapses reckless conduct with intentional conduct or equates them? Uh, well, I don't have any in front of me right now. I don't think that was raised at the district court. Well, I mean, the, the, the complaint under negligence, it says Gold Coast, this is paragraph 23 of the complaint, Gold Coast breached its duty to the city by recklessly, wantonly, and intentionally disposing of its corrosion. You're saying that basically it was recklessly intentional? I'm saying when they allege it as in the conjunctive, you can't ignore the intentional allegation. But reckless is, that rec doing something recklessly is different, back to Judge Oldham's question, than doing something intentionally. Well, but if you look at the, the definition, of, the guess my authority is a policy language, a definition is an accident. But can an accident, back to Judge Oldham's question, be recklessly committed without it being intentionally committed? No, I, I don't think so, because accident suggests there's no intent to cause harm. Reckless loses that. But, but, but where's your support for that? Other than me right now, <laughs> that that's, was not raised in the district court and it was not briefed. So, no, 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 not as it was raised. The district court looked at it and said it is reckless and intentional. Now, I, I think what the district court is saying is that he read the allegations, and I think correctly, as showing a state of mind that they were going to do this regardless of the consequences. They were trying to hide what they were doing. Something that happens consistently and surreptitiously for years and years is not an accident. And that might be true, and that might be why you don't have to identify him at the end of the day. The, the, the thing I'm hung up on is the distinction that counsel opposite led with, which is that obviously we're not talking about indemnification. We're talking about the duty to defend. And I'm, I'm wondering if I can help, if you can help me. Let's zoom out for a second and just do a hypothetical with you. It's not this case. All right, let's talk about a different case. The plaintiff comes in and alleges intentional, 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 intentional. My neighbor's tormenting me. All of this intentional, intentional, intentional. All kinds of intentional facts up and down the road. <coughs> and there's one count in the complaint, and the, claim, and the count is for negligence. Right? It's just negligence. That's the, that's the allegation. Under your theory, what's so weird about it is that <coughs> that plaintiff could go all the way to trial. Right? Their insurer says you're on your own. We're cutting, you know, thank you for your premium payments, but you're on your own. Defend yourself, because it says intentional, 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 and we don't care that the only allegation is negligence. It goes all the way to trial, and the jury finds, in fact, negligence, right? Maybe we don't actually agree with the intentionality stuff, but we agree it's negligent, and we're going to make you pay for the negligence. But under your theory, the insurance company is gone from the jump, right? Even though at the end of the day, even after it all gets tried, and it's all in front of the jury, and the jury comes back with negligence, the insurance company not, not only doesn't defend, but doesn't indemnify, even though at the end of the day, the thing the jury actually finds in the underlying litigation is both obligated to defend and obligated to indemnify. You see that, what's so weird about that? Uh, well, I do see, and in fact, there are cases in other jurisdictions that have addressed that distinction. Mississippi has not. Mississippi here is the rule that if there is no duty to defend, you can go and resolve duty to indemnify early because if it's, if it's based on the same facts. And in fact, we cited the Western Heritage case in our brief. I'd like to give two other cases on that from this court. One is ISOM, I-S-O-M versus Valley Forge, 716 Federal Appendix 280, page 287 from 2017. And Federal Insurance Company versus Singing River Health System, 850 F. 3rd, 187, page 198, also from 2017. That is the Mississippi standard. Now, if I could go to a slightly different subject, there is a completely independent ground for affirming outside of the occurrence issue, and that's the your work issue. Uh, policies have a standard definition of your work, but this policy has a designated operations endorsement that changes that definition. It defines your work as being the collection and transportation of restaurant grease and cooking oils. And these designated operations are fairly common among businesses that are engaged in activities that create risk of danger, uh, explosives, contractors, that kind of stuff, because the insurer is willing to assume some risks, but not others. In this case, they're willing to assume the risks involved in collecting and transporting oils and grease from one place to another.
There is, uh, of course, we're still at the, 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 the 12 v. 6 stage. So there's an allegation they had a contract to deposit with one, uh, I forget the name of the city, it starts with the P. P. Lahatchee. Uh, I, I thought you might know that. Uh, and that they did not dump there, they dumped into the public sewer system. And then they let her sign a contract with the city of Jackson. Um, but there were multiple, there's not one transaction. This is shipments over years and years. So, but I think the discharges were not transported. They left from the Gold Coast facility. They were not put on a truck. And, and, and I'm, I'm, that's my understanding. There's no allegation that during transportation, the trucks detoured and poured things into the water. It's alleged to have been part of Gold Coast's uh, plant operations. So that's the kind of thing that can happen that an insurer will not want to take the risk on. The cost of that can be very high. So that's why for a company like this, if you have an accident while you're collecting it or moving it around, we are covering that. But you're on notice that anything outside of that is not covered. And I don't think anyone will argue that intentionally dumping in sewer systems for years is an accident in transportation or collection. So uh, I think that understanding the court's concerns about the occurrence issue, I, I don't agree with the court obviously, but I think you can avoid that whole thing by saying under the your definition of your work, the allegations do not allege damages that occur from the normal operations of the company. They do not occur from the, the issues, the, the particular risks that are covered by the policy. Is this the, the point about your work? Is that because of paragraph five and the definition of occurrence that incorporates your work? I just want to make sure I'm tracking. There is a separate endorsement. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking on page at page 80 of the record. Page 80. Because mm -hmm. yeah, the, uh, the policy is attached to the complaint. Mm -hmm. And if you look at page 80, it will have the designated operations endorsement, which says the definition of your work in the common definitions is deleted and replaced by this. Sorry, I can see, I have the, the designated oper operations provision. I can see that. What I'm trying to figure out is when that replaces the old your work. Are you talking about the, the reason you care about this is because of the old your work that's in paragraph five? But, but we don't care about the old work definition because it's taken out and replaced by this. What I'm trying to make sure I understand is what is it that you are pointing us to in the original policy that gets replaced? And it, I, it, it, it is in the standard definitions. I don't have a page signed in front of me. Uh, but it basically says, you know, work done by you or on your behalf. So in that case, it's a very broad definition. And the exact purpose of the endorsement was to narrow that to the specific risk the carrier was willing to, 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 to assume. I'm, I'm sorry, I must be asking this in an, in an amorphous and ambiguous way, so I, I, I apologize to you. I understand how the, the, the new your work definition replaces the old your work definition. I get that. But when you, the reason that all of this matters is because I, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, tell me if I'm wrong, but in paragraph five, it says this, the occurrence arises out of your out of, work. Out of your work, yes. That's all I was trying to. I'm make. sorry, I, I missed the point on that. But yeah, right. it, it, it is part of the definition of what's covered is your work, and then that is further defined to specific operations. So I, that same paragraph says, or your product delivered during the policy period. I don't, I might just not have it in front of me, but what is your product? Part of your product? Yeah, so the, the same paragraph that we're talking about says the occurrence arises out of your work, that's what we are just talking about, performed during the policy period, or your product. Well, keep in mind that's a standard form. It's, it's not this client or this, this insured. Uh, it would apply to a product manufacturer, product defect claim. Oh, so they don't have anything covered. I, I, I don't think they, they ever claimed to have had a product. It's just their work. Right. I, I think that, and Mr. Taggart may disagree with me, because uh, I heard a lot of things from him today I did not see in their brief before. I did want to mention real quickly, he said that the right. judge ignored uh, Ms. James' attachment. I'm not the only one hearing that, right? Where they came from. But on page, page four of the court's opinion, he addresses Ms. James in, the, in footnote six, where she says the jar tests were never mentioned. He, manager said he'd never done a jar test, and the parties don't tell us what a jar test is. Now, I think that's, again, outside the eight corners, but it's incorrect to say that the judge didn't consider it. I would mention that, that there is on uh, the intentional acts exclusion on 
the uh, third up party liability part and the uh, on uh, the definition of timing of damage under the uh, contract. I'm leaving as soon as I get off the bench. I've got to go catch an airplane, so, yeah, so I'll just leave it, leave it there. Um, yeah. um, can we? Can the courtroom deputy give him an extra minute to sum up? I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Take your time. My last point is, and we've addressed in the brief, both the third party liability part and the contractors right, have an additional reason for excluding the coverage. And I know my time is up. Oh, please um, take a minute to all right. sum up. There's an intentional acts exclusion in the third party liability coverage part. Uh, that's quoted at page 13 of our brief. Also in known conditions, and remember the allegations are this had been going on for several years before 2014. I'm glad you had, uh, mentioned that because I was gonna actually ask if, if the, this allegation that it was happening up, up into 2014, does that take it outside of the policy coverage also based on what I think you're saying, which is they knew about it beforehand and it was continuing before they ever contracted with the insurance it, company? It takes it both out under the definition of, of what's covered, but also for the third party liability coverage under the known conditions. Now there is not intentional acts or known condition in the contractor's liability part, but that is the one that says anything that starts before the policy period and carries into the policy period is all deemed to have happened before and therefore it's not covered. So a second reason you don't need to address occurrence under those, and they do claim under the two separate parts, so besides your work, there's a second for each. Any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your argument. Mr. Taggart. Thank you, Your Honor. So I'd like first to address the very first point that counsel raised. My argument was that the only issue before the court for consideration today is the duty to defend. We make very clear in our briefs that we're asking the court to reverse and render on the duty to defend and reverse and remand on the duty to indemnify. The court does not have before it what it needs to resolve the issue of the duty to indemnify, except that Judge Wingate's decision was there's no duty to indemnify because there's no duty to defend. So I completely dis uh, uh, disagree with counsel's suggestion that somehow we've waived that argument. But I do want to get Judge Oldham to the heart of the matter, which I believe your questions get to, and that is the very fact of the matter is that unlike the case of, say, Allstate versus Moulton or the case of USF&G uh, uh, versus... Uh, 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 I'll, I'll think of it in just a moment. The two cases, oh, Omnibank, the two cases that are cited in the briefs about what is an occurrence and how can an intentional act ever be an occurrence, this case is different from those. In those two cases, on the one hand, somebody swore out a criminal affidavit. Well, that can't be an accident. In another case, the bank uh, forced placed insurance coverage. Well, that can't be an accident. Here, the allegation is that Gold Coast intentionally discharged but in fact, Gold Coast could in fact have accidentally discharged. Very much to your point, Your Honor, the jury could very well have concluded that uh, the accidental discharge resulted in damages that were caused by Gold Coast resulting in con a, a compensatory award. The reason to your question, Judge Wilson, that uh, the city of Brandon wanted to, to spread such broad, strong claims about intentional acts is they wanted to be sure that they could jump the threshold statute in Mississippi that's required before a case can even go to the jury on punitive damages. In our state, there has to be a hearing before the trial court outside the presence of the jury to determine whether the matter even may go to uh, the jury on punitive damages. And, and Brandon wanted to set themselves up every single stage that they could. Well, but, but none of that's in the complaint. What we have are the allegations in the complaint, which certainly speak to intentional or continuous conduct that wouldn't be an accident maybe the second third fourth 17th time it was committed so how do you how do you get beyond that what is, is council officer right that we only look at the eight corners strictly no exhibits anything and if so what do you go to the complaint well, well first of all council notably did not cite any authority for that proposition and then secondly i would suggest to the court that the complaint invites a review of the exhibits they're not just stuck on there as surplusage every time 
the complaint refers to some facts that require the backup of the exhibits. The complaint says, see exhibit thus and such. In fact, in, in, the, in the footnote, it even quotes from exhibit C, which was not quoting when it, uh, the, the, the language that was quoted in the complaint. So, uh, but the complaint also repeatedly says, this is a pattern. It's been going on for years. They've repeatedly done it. They weren't taking anything to Pelahatchie, even though they were contractually uh, bound to do so, or in, in agreement to do so, until after the DEQ showed up. I mean, all of this speaks to intentional conduct, doesn't it? What I would say to that, Your Honor, is there are only four respects in which there is a specific date mentioned in the complaint. October 6th, October 10th, October 11th, and November 4th. On none of those occasions does the complaint allege an intentional act, specifically with respect to the one discharge of which Brandon claims actually to have evidence having happened, October 6, 2016, the allegation is water was discharged into the sewer, not intentionally, not even recklessly, and the question even was asked, what accident might have caused this and the Gold Coast guys say, we just don't know. It, 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 it's not something that we would have done. In fact, to Mr. Douglas's point from the, that very same memo, we don't put anything down the sewer except what's supposed to go down the sewer. Now, what I would say to this, Your Honors, is most of us in our businesses buy claims made policies because they're less expensive. Sometimes folks buy occurrence policies even though they're more expensive. Gold Coast bought an occurrence policy and a claims made policy and really all they got in return was a nice shiny medallion from Crum and Forster to glue onto the front of their grill because there's no engine in the car. The simple the fact of the matter is these people paid a huge premium to be covered in an event just like this and they were denied and this court can set it right and I ask that you do so. Thank you counsel, we have your argument. The case is submitted and that'll conclude the arguments for this session. Um, the court will stand in recess.